Hey, welcome to the WebAssembly Zone. So I've titled my talk a field report. By that I mean it's just uh, you know gathering the results from experiments I ran in a sort of a home or personal project. And the idea was to combine the WebAssembly in the context of Next.js. So though quickly just about me, my name is Daniel Lozon. My handle is Danaru in most places. And I'm also a Ottawa JavaScript community organizer. So roughly just to position us, obviously this is a conference about Next.js, but um, uh, uh, we're just going to discuss the parts of it that interested me and, and drew me to it. And then we're going to have a quick review at what exactly WebAssembly is and what it might be used for. And then we'll walk through the experiments that I actually have done and conclude with some remarks. So uh, Next.js is a React framework. It's an open source framework. Um, it's, uh, <coughs> it's championed by the people at Vercel who are also going on this conference, uh, formerly known as Zeiten now, or on, under which you might have known it. Um, Next.js is often uh, uh, talked about as a static site generator, but I think it's a little more than that, and we'll see uh, why. Uh, it has a lot of great features, uh, some of which uh, I chose to highlight here. There's a fantastic tutorial um, on the next site. It was just really worth your time if you're just trying to, uh, to get into things. And also, there are a ton of great examples uh, uh, on, on, the, on the main repo as well. Uh, for my purposes, the things that actually attracted me to, to Next.js, especially in this context, first of all, is very, very fast and light. So it has all kinds of nice features like server-side rendering and uh, compile time or build time generation. Um, I really like the fact that uh, we have a router already built into the framework. Um, another uh, really nice feature is this idea or the integration of API routes. So that uh, uh, we're going to cover this in more detail in the talk, but um, the idea that there are some functions which, which you can deploy with your uh, with your static site that are actually dynamic and get deployed according to the context uh, is a really great fit with uh, Vercel as a deployment option. But you're lo and certainly lo not locked into that. And it's certainly too possible to deploy it in other ways. And you can wrap it up in a Docker container. At the end of the day, this can just run as a Node.js app. OK, coming to the crux of it, what exactly is WebAssembly? So first of all, uh, WebAssembly is a binary instruction format, so a kind of bytecode, if you will. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as we say, it's part of the open web now, so it has been standardized, I'm sure as many standards do, it will continue to evolve. It has a rich history, so this is not something that's uh, just come along. Uh, some experiment, actually it's very storied and interesting history, starting out with experiments at uh, Mozilla. Uh, some of you may have heard of it uh, described through things like Inscripton and WASM. Um, but today, uh, the fact is there is a standard and is supported in all the evergreen browsers, so Edge and Chrome and Safari and Firefox, and a lot of mobile browsers, and even more interestingly, also supported by Node.js. has some nice properties, uh, uh, like a well-defined uh, security boundaries and sandbox. Uh, the other nice thing is, so this is a compiled target. It's a, As I said, it's a kind of a bytecode, but a lot of languages uh, compile to it. So most notably, Rust and C++ and Go, which are very popular, and, and the .NET platforms. But there are literally uh, dozens uh, more. So here's an awesome website with a list of all of these. Obviously, uh, uh, these languages don't all have the same level of maturity of support for WebAssembly. But you can see that there's quite a lot of interest in the idea of WebAssembly. Uh, so yes, multiple run times. The other nice thing is that uh, these WebAssembly, these these um, these functions that you define in WebAssembly. They are sort of callable from JavaScript in and out. So you can call JavaScript from WebAssembly, and you can also call WebAssembly from JavaScript. So it's quite flexible in the way that you assemble your things. I love this quote by Jeff Atwood, per particularly because I think it's a little ambiguous. Never sure when people quote it if they mean any application can be written in JavaScript, will it eventually be written in JavaScript, but it shouldn't. But in this context, uh, for me, 
I think it's just, uh, you know, the story of the evolution and uh, ever greater penetration of JavaScript and its ecosystem uh, into all kinds of things. You know, we, we author JavaScript now not just for our browser, but it's in our backends and it's in our databases. It's a, it's a, it's a ubiquitous thing. And the idea that uh, we can bring other runtimes to JavaScript engines just even widens that uh, even more. So what might be the benefit of including other languages into our JavaScript environment? Well, the first thing I can think of is to reuse some existing code. So a lot of stuff has been written in, in JavaScript, and the testament to which is the, the size of the, the NPM ecosystem. Um, but there are things that may have already be, been authored in other languages which you might want to leverage or benefit from. You know, maybe it's a thing like a crypto uh, library or a game engine or machine learning kernels or distributed web. So uh, as much as there's awesome code written in JavaScript, there's a lot of other awesome code written in other ecosystems. And now perhaps these, uh, these things don't have to be uh, exclusively um, disconnected. Maybe they can talk to each other. Another feature of some languages, perhaps I call this expressiveness, but you know, there are some kinds of problems which are maybe better suited to uh, other runtimes. Uh, for, for all the love we have for JavaScript, uh, its number types are sometimes not the best to do some kinds of things with. Uh, there are other properties of uh, these uh, other languages which we might want to inherit, which may be specific to the languages. And I'm thinking here of, uh, you know, uh, Rust's memory safety uh, and control, or things like Go's native uh, structures for channels and Go routines. So these are things that we may uh, benefit from in specific contexts. And now the idea that we can bring those to the JavaScript uh, ecosystem with WebAssembly is quite enticing. Okay, so as I said, this is a personal experimentation. This is the one way that I pick the things that I, 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 I work on. Uh, so I pick a thing I know and I pick a thing I wanna learn. So I have some pet projects that I've re-implemented multiple times. So sort of uh, um, get away from the idea of always learning a, a new domain and reusing that expertise uh, is quite useful in getting up to speed quickly. So that's exactly what I did here. So the thing to learn uh, is the mix of WebAssembly and Next.js. And the thing that I already knew that I want to bring to it is something called a zone plate generator, which I'm going to explain to you in a second. So what is a zone plate? A zone plate is a uh, visual pattern. It's actually used uh, uh, often to test video systems. So the idea of this image and ones like it is that uh, uh, it's sort of a frequency map. Sometimes it's called a chirp. And the idea is that it includes all level of details and in all directions for these images. So it's very nice to, to, uh, to use to test how a video system responds to different uh, varying levels of detail. So you can see here that in the middle, we have a very smooth, low frequency image. And over on the right or the top, we have super high uh, frequency or very rapidly varying images. So how do you make one of these? Well, luckily, it's relatively simple. So the idea is that for every pixel, there's a function that we have to compute. It's pretty simple, some kind of a, a squaring going on. But the idea is that in this case, is a reasonable amount of computation. Uh, uh, and I thought this is the kind of thing that might benefit from, uh, from some WebAssembly love. So to that end, uh, we implement a pattern like this in JavaScript. So if this is a rendering function, uh, it's, uh, the idea is here that I'm computing uh, um, a data structure that I'm going to return from this function. And basically, I do a loop over an entire image. So, you know, for y equals, for x equals. And then I do a little bit of math, nothing too obscene. And then I uh, uh, write the value of the pixel back out. So this is the JavaScript version. Now I can do the same thing in Rust, and it looks quite similar, although a little different, and a little few more types, but the same idea. So I got the data structure that I'm going to be returning, or into which I'm going to write. Then I have a, you know, a, a, an iteration over all the pixel uh, coordinates, I'm doing a little bit of math, and setting the values out. So <clears throat> this is the equivalent code that we had 
in the JavaScript, but now implemented in Rust. And a third version of it is in Go. So very, very similar idea. So we have a, a, a two-fold iteration over the both image coordinates, do a little bit of math, and then we set our, uh, our pixel uh, data back out. So we have this rendering function which is able to compute uh, uh, our image, and we have three parallel implementations of it. So the last two, Rust and Go, have been compiled to WebAssembly. So now we have a chance of invoking all three of these functions from JavaScript interchangeably. So what we did next was we turned that into a React component by creating uh, you know, a Canvas 2D, invoking the renderer, and now we have our pattern. Uh, the next thing that I did is I am animated this thing, which we'll talk a bit about, which we'll talk about a bit later. Uh, and then I also added an annotation overlay so I could have some information out of what's going on exactly. So of interest here is just the, 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 the name of the language of the renderer and uh, crucially uh, its uh, frame rate and the timestamp that the, each image is generated at. Uh, on the top left, we have the actual rendering time. So this is the number of milliseconds to compute all those pixel values. And finally, we web assemble it, and so that is that now I am reusing that same React component, but inject, injecting a different render function that is either in JavaScript or Rust or Go. And um, that's what you see before you. So this is the crux of the experiment, basically. Obviously, now that it's a component, I could just stick it all over the place and I can have as many as I want, which is sort of fun to play with. And you see that these things start and stop quite quickly. So uh, I wrote a little app that, uh, that used this component and had some, uh, some places to experiment where I could you know, change the size of the image and change the coordinates of the pattern uh, and change the runtime, obviously. Funnily enough, um, although this is the app that I built, uh, as we saw, I've already introduced these things uh, uh, in the slide deck. And the reason I was able to do that is because when I came to author the deck, obviously I picked Next.js to, to, uh, to do so. And so this React component that I wrote for the app, I can embed in my slides. It's just that easy. OK, so I mentioned there that uh, we wanted to animate the sequence. So the renderer, although I presents the simplified version, actually has a time parameter, which I want to render quickly in succession. So <clears throat> turns out that there's a great uh, web API uh, to perform animation. It's called Request Animation Frame. And the idea is that you give it a function, uh, uh, and you basically call it repeatedly. So I wrote a custom hook called Use Animation Frame here. And uh, the idea is that uh, I request animation frame of this function, which calls itself back. So the nice thing about request animation frame is that it performs timing uh, for us so that basically it'll call the function uh, as often as possible up to 60 frames per second, although the actual framework can be uh, browser dependent. But that's what we see here in this hook. Basically, uh, when this hook is invoked, uh, there's a, a side effect computed, which invokes request animation frame uh, with a function, and that function calls itself back. Uh, one thing which I learned in using hooks uh, 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 this way is that uh, when you have a use effect hook, you have to return a cleanup function, right? So request animation frame works somewhat like uh, set timeout or set interval, set interval rather and that you can actually cancel uh, uh, the interval timer, or in this case, the request animation frame timer. So that when this component is mounted, the animation frame is triggered. And when the component is unmounted, that, uh, that process is uh, cleaned up so that we don't have any uh, leaks. OK, so the other thing that we mentioned in our WebAssembly slide was that 
uh, we can use the same component and inject a, a, a renderer, uh, the renderer that's implemented in JavaScript, Go, and Rust. So the question is, how do I load that into my code? So this is more the WebAssembly part. So it turns out that with uh, the Rust tool chain, when you compile your Rust to WebAssembly, you actually get a little module. And the only thing that you have to do basically is, especially in the context of Next, is you just import that and you get an object <coughs> which has members for each of the functions that you uh, export from that Rust module. So this is all that it takes to get that rendering function uh, uh, from WASM into, into JavaScript. So this, uh, this object here is a JavaScript invocable function and I can just return it. In the case of Go, it is a little more involved. So it turns out that uh, um, Go, when it's running, and I'm not talking about WebAssembly here, I'm just talking about uh, Go in general, actually has a runtime associated with it. So this runtime uh, performs uh, memory management and garbage collection. It also manages uh, threads for Go routines and all kinds of things like that. So you can't just invoke a piece of, uh, of Go WebAssembly uh, 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 just as a function because it needs to be part of this runtime. So that's why the uh, the instantiation process is a little more involved. So there's a few parts to it. Um, first of all, you need to uh, uh, import this Go object, capital G, Go, from a, uh, from a JavaScript file that is exported from the Go tool chain. And then you combine that with the WASM that was produced from the compiler. And here's the chain. So uh, this uh, this constructor function <coughs> that was imported from the from the JavaScript is instantiated, so new Go, and uh, then we recuperate the bytes from the WebAssembly, uh, and then we use the WebAssembly functions to instantiate. So, uh, in the case of Rust that we just saw, basically this import that's basically all it does it does a Web WebAssembly instantiate with the WASM bytes that are here. In the case of Go, we have to use a more sophisticated invocation of WebAssembly where we say um, instantiate these WASM bytes, but also here's an object that you get to import into that runtime. So there's a bunch of support functions that are in this thing which come from the constructor. And finally, once you have this instance that's sort of ready to go, you have to actually run it. So this is a method on this little Go object. You have to run it, which basically starts the runtime. Uh, in this case, <coughs> it happened that one of the things that this uh, GoWasm did was actually, once it started, actually exports one of its functions onto the main window object. So this is a bit convoluted, but once the runtime starts, it actually uh, exports dynamically one of those functions to the, uh, to the JavaScript global object. And so finally, now we have a function that's wired into a running runtime. Now we can invoke it. So you see that <clears throat> depending on the runtime, these kinds of things can be more and more or less involved. Okay, last subject, uh, API, API routes. So we saw that in the context of uh, Next.js app, um, the same place that the, API, uh, that the router allows you to put pages, <clears throat> that's usually the pages directory, if you have a special folder called API, uh, any files in there are expected to export a single function, which is a route handler. So, in our case, uh, this looks, this is the actual function. So I mounted this at API slash zone. And basically this is a, a request handler, right? So this is just destructuring the request. And my response is the place I'm going to write my, my output to. And the idea here is that I wanted to reuse the renderer, actually the three renderers that I already had uh, uh, defined in my and used in my React component. So uh, what we do inside of this route, so this is uh, running inside a node process, uh, we instantiate a canvas. It turns out that there is a Node.js implementation of the canvas API that we have in the browser, the, the module is called Canvas. And from that, I can get a 2D context uh, from which I can get an, a, a, a data bitmap. And I can, just as I did in the React component, uh, 
uh, invoke one of my three renderers, uh, the one in Go or Rust or JavaScript. Once uh, uh, this renderer is called, now my image data is, is full, and all I need to do is to pipe that, uh, that image through something called the PNG stream. Uh, there are other streams, but basically I can just pipe out the result in the 2D canvas right out to my response. So long story short, uh, this very, very small piece of code was able to combine the renders that I already had in JavaScript, Rust, and Go, and now serve it from uh, the API uh, route. So this is what this looks like. Basically, I'm invoking the API route, and it's actually producing an image. So this is now a, a URL that I can fetch as an image. You can just see that this way. And now, once again, uh, here I just have a map of images with URLs. We'll just keep hitting that route over and over. And we can see that uh, it's actually uh, uh, pretty fast to, to, to re-render all of these images. So each one of these images is actually just uh, an image tag with a URL that is, you know, slash API slash zone with appropriate parameters to get the ones that I want. The other thing that you can see here just visually is uh, first of all the render time that doesn't include the the transport time obviously but you can see that these things are, are rendered pretty much as quickly as they they were in the browser uh, the other thing that you see that's sort of of interest inside of uh, the actual implementation that that's running here um, i decorated the the outer border of the image with a unique identifier to each serverless function that's uh, that's being created so you can actually see here that all of these blue outlined uh, 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 zones were rendered by the same lambda. And all the different colors represent different lambdas that were dynamically spun up. So it gives you an idea of how dynamic this thing is. Okay, performance. Well, the first takeaway is, my god, JavaScript engines are really, really fast. So, you know, Take benchmarking with uh, with a grain of salt as usual, but uh, just to give us a, an idea that first of all, uh, I was able to benchmark in all of these platforms because it ran there. So these are reported just the number of milliseconds it takes to render uh, a, a rather large uh, 720 by 40 frame. Um, and you can see here that in the Chrome on my desktop, we had Rust coming in just a little bit faster than than JS, but generally. A JavaScript implementation was actually the fastest of, of all, except a few uh, exceptions. You know, some platforms uh, were running noticeably slower, um, but that's not to say that that won't evolve over time. Yeah. So if you're uh, experimenting and bringing uh, 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 some, some WebAssembled code to your JavaScript engine, this is probably a thing that you need to, to exploit. If timing and performance is super critical, maybe it's something you need to, to examine and test it out on a lot of platforms, as we do naturally for, for JavaScript in general when, when we're running really tightly and performant code. There's another aspect to this which I think we need to, to consider is there is a cost to calling into WebAssembly from JavaScript and uh, or not in our case, but calling back out to JavaScript from, from WebAssembly. And uh, this can take on a few characteristics. So in our case, uh, we said that we were invoking uh, the rendering function by calling request animation frame. So we'd be crossing that boundary every time we used one of the renderers that was uh, done in WebAssembly. Uh, and that turned out to be not a problem. So we're calling a function, we're crossing that boundary like 60 times a second for each of the components that's mounted. There are other cases where, you know, if you're uh, uh, using a more complex data structure, it may not have a direct equivalent in JavaScript and say Rust or, or Go. And uh, to cross the boundary, uh, if you don't have access to, a, you know, a, a sort of a, um, a compatible uh, data array, you may well have to serialize things to JSON or, or another format uh, 
uh, uh, every time you cross the boundary if you have a complicated data structure. So this is the one thing that you need to uh, to take a account of. Obviously, in our case, we had a data structure that was basically just the bitmap, so a uint8 array, and that was represented well in all languages. So we didn't have so much of, of that problem. Okay, so challenges. Well, one of the main ones I found was around reuse. So I actually split my uh, my experimental repository into a mono repo, where uh, you know different directories just map to uh, uh, specific modules. Um, <clears throat> that implies understanding how bundling uh, works a little better. Uh, the boundaries are sometimes a little fuzzy, so just uh, moving some JavaScript over is not too hard, but sometimes there are other types of assets in the thing that you're trying to bundle. In our case, the actual WASM bytes, um, or fonts, or CSS styles, and so, you know, Webpack loaders get you part of the way, but it's not always obvious how that can cross the, uh, the module boundary. So I think this is the evolving space in any case with things like uh, Snowpack and native ESM modules and Node and in the browser. So this is a space to watch. I'm hoping this gets simpler. Sometimes our intent is really clear. You know, you have this thing that works in your program, you want to extract it into a module. So it's nice if that was just easy to map to, uh, to external modules. Uh, another thing, uh, uh, so when you bring in a, another one of these runtimes, sometimes you have to adopt uh, you know, a special tooling or understand the space a little better. In Go's case, there's actually an alternate uh, Go compiler called TinyGo, which is targeted at uh, resource constraint environments, uh, like single board computers. But it turns out that WebAssembly is just such a target. And actually, TinyGo uh, produces much smaller uh, WASM files. Uh, I had a few issues trying to get it to work with uh, memory allocation and limits there. So just partly just uh, uh, probably a evolving and be my not knowing exactly how to get it done, but uh, definitely possible to shrink the binaries, you know, by a factor of 10, which is uh, rather nice. Uh, generally, other takeaways, first of all, Next.js has really been a pleasure to, first of all, learn and, uh, and use. And I'd say that a nice feature, and this is not specific to Next, is this reuse of composition and separation of concerns. Uh, you know, this is a long evolving story, but I think we've learned this lesson well. You know, our React components have turned into functions, their state management have turned into hooks, which are functions. Uh, Next.js, this idea of controlling uh, static site generation and uh, uh, and so forth is run through these properties called get static paths and props, which are functions. Um, deploying a Dynamics uh, uh, server side. Uh, Functions again with the API routes is great, and now with WebAssembly, anything that they export as uh, as functions are also really composable. Just in general, I'd like to say that uh, I found that when I'm just going through the Next.js examples, for example, a lot of the features I was able to bring are really quite orthogonal, and and have this feature of separating concerns, which is quite nice. I think it's a testament to a, a good design. Uh, finally, uh, WebAssembly is definitely usable today, you know, subject to the constraints and the kinds of discussions we've had. Uh, it's definitely worth investigating, you know, of course, in the context of a specific problem you're trying to solve, but uh, this is doable today. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And uh, if you have anything you'd like to discuss further, please just uh, reach out. Thank you very much. Thank you.